Please turn in your Bibles today to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 and place a marker in Hebrews chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 5. Today when I read, I'm going to be reading from the New International Version of the Word. We're continuing our series today called Grateful. In this series, we're spending time talking about things that we as believers should be grateful for. In week number one, we talked about being grateful for freedom, both the physical freedoms that we have because of the men and the women who have given their lives to pay for those freedoms and the spiritual freedom from sin that we have because Christ gave his life to pay the price. Then last week we talked about being grateful for community. Now listen, if you had to miss last week's message, I want to encourage you to visit our YouTube channel and give it a listen. I truly believe that a strong sense of community within the church is vital to a happy, healthy, and full life as a believer. This week, though, I want us to move on to something else that we should be grateful for, but I don't want to just tell you what that is. Instead, I, I want to talk about our first passage, and then you can see if you can figure out what our topic is. Let's start by looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 3 together. It says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Church, aren't you grateful for milk? If you love milk, I want you to raise your hand. Quite a few hands out there. Listen, you are in luck. Connor, Anna, Kate, could you come give me a hand, please? Listen, I knew that you were going to be here this morning and that you were going to lift your hand. You are going to say how much you love milk. So, you know what? I, I just brought you some. We have it sitting right here in our refrigerator. And they're going to grab it. Anna, Kate, you come this way. Grab those for me. Look at that. All right. Look at that. That is cold milk. There you go. Hurry back to the people with their hands raised. Now, listen, they were up earlier. I saw them. Christina, give us a hand. Hurry now. Well, I changed my mind. You've taken this one, too. All right. Go out there. Get your hands up. If you love milk, get your hands up. Now, listen, if your hand was up earlier and it's not up now, you're going to hell. Get, get your hand up. You want milk, right? There you go. Another cup. Now, don't drink that yet. Hurry, Connor. That's your milk. Christina doesn't have any milk yet. Oh, yeah. That's right. There you go. You can take the rest. All right. First of all, give Connor and Anna Kate a hand. Now, all you milk lovers out there, cheers. That's good stuff right there. I'm going to put that right there. Oh, my goodness. Get back up here to my scripture that I read. Don't you just love a nice cold glass of milk?
Milk is an amazing thing. Not only does it taste great, according to the Florida Dairy Farmers Association, milk is also good for you. They say that it boosts your immune system, it strengthens your bones and your teeth, it aids in digestive health, it strengthens your heart, it beautifies your skin and hair. And then they talk about some non-physical benefits. They even claim that consuming milk leads to improved emotional and mental health. That it has a calming effect. And that it can give you a boost of energy. Milk is basically a miracle drug. Listen, I have to tell you, if you're here today and your body is lactose intolerant, I am sorry on behalf of the whole world. I I just want to forgive or, or ask for your forgiveness this morning. But the good news is this. Someday you're going to have a glorified body, incapable of being sick, and you're going to be able to drink all the milk that you want. I don't know why you're not shouting and saying amen. You know, I guess when you think about all of the health benefits that milk has, it's kind of obvious why it was the undisputed choice of beverage to go along with school lunch. You know, it makes sense that we have to give our kids the most healthy drink that we can to go along with their pancakes on a stick, their vegetable medley, and their rectangular pizza slices. So no no wonder we use this extremely healthy drink. Truth be told, though, our attachment to milk doesn't begin in grade school, does it? Our craving of milk starts the moment that we're born. We crave milk from from being an infant, and boy, do we crave it. Raise your hand if you've ever been in a room where a child wanted milk, and for whatever reason, they weren't able to have it right then. That is not a fun situation. They want milk, and they let you know about it. I think every one of those babies could be in a J.G. Wentworth commercial, and if you could hear, if you could understand what they're saying, they'd be saying, it's my milk, and I want it now. That craving for milk is a natural instinct because even before we're able to clearly communicate our feelings and our thoughts and our emotions and our needs, we understand that that milk is critical for our survival. Well, in the passage we just read, Peter encourages us as new believers to crave spiritual milk in the same way that infants crave physical milk. Now, what is spiritual milk? Well, when Peter tells us to crave spiritual milk in the same way that infants crave milk, he's referring to the Word of God. You see, if you, if you look at the original Greek of this passage, And you see the word that he combined with milk there. It was the word logikos. Everybody say logikos. Logikos is a word which basically pertains to speech or speaking. So he's telling us to crave the milk of the word. Now, if I were to ask you today, what is the topic we're talking about? What are we grateful for? I think it would probably have two answers. The first one would be milk. Because some of you are just really, really excited that I brought you milk this morning. To those people, you're welcome. The second answer of what we're grateful for, people would probably say spiritual milk, or they might say the Bible, or they might say the Word of God. And that's a pretty good guess, because that's what the apostle has just encouraged us to crave. But the truth is that both of those answers are incorrect. That's not what we're talking about being grateful for today. Now, don't get me wrong. I am very grateful for milk. I love milk. I love plain milk. I love chocolate milk. I love strawberry milk. I even love caramel milk. I love having milk in my coffee. I love things that are cooked with milk. I love dipping my cookies in milk. And you know what I really love? I really, really, really love that leftover milk at the bottom of a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch. That's some good milk right there. I am grateful for milk, and I'm also grateful for spiritual milk. I'm grateful for the Word of God. 
I'm grateful for what it teaches me about God. I'm grateful for what it teaches me about other people. I'm grateful for what it teaches me about myself. I'm grateful for the historical value that the Word of God has. I'm grateful for how it tells me how to interact with God and how to interact with other people. And I'm very fond of the fact that the Word of God tells me how I can gain eternal life. I am grateful for spiritual milk, but neither physical nor spiritual milk are the main thing I'm grateful for this morning. I want to to read this passage again, just verses 2 and 3. It says, like newborn babies, crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Church, today I am grateful for growth. As believers, we should be grateful for growth. You see, milk is good, but what's really good is the result of milk. Peter says that like physical milk, spiritual milk enables us to grow up, and that is something worth being grateful for. See, we're not told in 1 Peter chapter 2 to crave milk simply for milk's sake. We're told to crave it so that we can grow in our faith, and that's the key to this passage. That's what it's about. As one of my friends would say, that's what's up. As believers, we are expected to grow in our faith. We are expected to grow in our relationship with God. We're expected to grow in our walk. And if you don't believe me, turn over to Hebrews chapter 5, and I'll prove it to you. In Hebrews chapter 5, the author is trying to explain some really complex spiritual truths, but they're struggling. And the reason that the author is struggling to explain these truths is because he knows that some of the people who will receive his letter haven't grown to the point where they can understand these truths. He says, we have a lot to say about this, but it's difficult to explain to you. And that's where I want us to pick up in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 5. It says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. What's it say next? You need milk, not solid food. He goes on to say, anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Church, let me tell you something. I love milk, but if you give me the choice of I can either have nothing but milk for the rest of my life or I can have solid food, you better believe I'm going to go with steak and eggs and peanut butter and jelly and a whole mess of other foods over just having milk. I think we all would. I think even the people whose bodies are lactose intolerant, who have craved milk for their whole lives, who have seen us enjoy it and rub it in their faces, I think even those people If you gave them the choice, hey, you can be healed today of your lactose intolerance, but from now on, you can only have milk. Or you can stay like you are, and you can eat solid foods. Don't you think that most of them, almost all of them, would say, I'll stick with food? Despite what the Florida Dairy Farmers Association might tell you, that's really the most logical choice. I think we would be hard-pressed to find anyone who would choose milk over and over and over for the rest of their lives with no solid food. That would be ridiculous. It would be ludicrous. But unfortunately, in the spiritual realm, it happens all the time. In fact, it happened here in Hebrews chapter 5, and that's what the author is writing about. In Hebrews 5.12, the author describes as milk the elementary truths of God's Word. In other words, the basics. He goes on in the beginning of chapter 6 to list what some of those basics are. He says that they include teachings on repentance, 
teachings on faith in God and on cleansing rites and on the laying on of hands, on the resurrection of the dead and on eternal judgment. Church, these things are foundational truths of our faith. They are spiritual milk. They're vital to our growth, but they're not made to sustain us for our entire spiritual life. Today, I want to share with you three things that come to light when we read these passages. And the first thing I want you to know this morning is that there's nothing wrong with milk. Peter tells us to crave spiritual milk. He tells us that that's what enables us to grow. He says it's important. And even here in Hebrews 5, when the author is is chastising the church for getting stuck on spiritual milk, he doesn't say that milk is a bad thing. If anyone ever tells you that milk is a bad thing, they're lying. These elemental truths are crucial to a new believer. Church, we need to be taught about repentance from the acts that lead to death, don't we? We need to be taught that. We need to be taught that sexually immoral people, that idolaters and adulterers and men who have sex with men and thieves and greedy people and drunkards and slanderers and swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. We need to be taught that. We need to be taught about faith in God and how that's the only way that we can be forgiven of that list of sins and so many more. We need to be taught about how we can receive healing through the laying on of hands and how there's someday going to be a resurrection. And then after that resurrection, there's going to be a judgment. We need to be taught these things. It's extremely important. Just like an infant needs milk to provide nourishment and enabling them to grow, new believers need these teachings to provide spiritual nourishment, enabling us to grow. Amen? These truths provide a foundation, and we need a strong foundation. There's nothing wrong with milk. But see, the problem comes when people get stuck on only milk. The second thing I want you to know today is that milk can't sustain you forever. Milk can't sustain you forever. These truths that we read about here, they provide a great foundation. But there comes a time when we need more than just a foundation. There comes a time when we need more. Has anyone here ever built a home? I don't mean you built it with your bare hands or, or, or even built it yourself. Has anyone here ever contracted to have a home built? I remember when Christina and I had our first home built. We were so excited when they moved from just pushing dirt around to actually pouring a foundation. We would go out there on that, on that blank concrete slab, and we would look around. We, we, we'd pretend, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd pretend I was sitting in the living room, you know, and I'd call back to the bedroom, Christina, come on in here. You know, she'd try to walk through the walls. I'd be like, no, 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 you got to go through the hallway. Which was just a line that was drawn on the slab. We would look for imperfections in the foundation. Like, we'd look for low spots or cracks, and we'd call the builder and say, hey, you're going to take care of this, right? You got to make sure this, this is what it's supposed to be. You got to make sure it's right. See, I had sung the song in kids' church about the wise man and the poor man. I knew how important it was to have a foundation a strong, solid foundation so that when the rains came down and the floods came up, my house didn't come tumbling down. And I know, too, today that in our lives, a strong spiritual foundation is fundamental. It's important for when the rain comes down and the floods come up. But just like I wouldn't have wanted to have lived on that concrete pad with no walls and no doors and no roof, I know that it's also not healthy to be a Christian who only knows the fundamentals, who only knows the basics. Now, listen, don't get me wrong. Will you go to heaven if all you know is the fundamentals? Absolutely you will. Absolutely. If you know that... You've, if, that you've sinned, that you're a sinner, and that because of that you need to be saved, and that God provided a way through his son Jesus Christ for you to be saved by grace, and you have faith in God, and you accept that forgiveness, then you're going to go to heaven. 
Absolutely you will. But will it hinder your ability to continue to grow and to deepen your faith? Will only knowing the basics hinder your ability to endure the storms that are no doubt going to come your way? Will only knowing the basics hinder your ability to grow in your faith and to lead other people into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Absolutely it will. Milk is great to start on, but it can't sustain you forever. Verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews chapter 6 challenge us to move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation. Move beyond the basics. Move beyond the fundamentals. Move beyond the elemental teachings of Christ. The author here even tells his audience that by now they should be teaching other people the fundamentals. But instead, they need to be taught them over and over and over. Instead, they keep forgetting that they're not supposed to do these certain sins. Instead, they keep forgetting that they need to have faith in God. Instead, they keep forgetting that they can have healing through the laying on of hands. Instead, they keep forgetting. They have to be taught over and over and over. Church, how many times has the Lord had to teach you the same lesson over and over and over? There's nothing wrong with milk, but it can't sustain you forever. We need to move forward. We need to mature. The last thing I want you to know today is that maturity comes through intentional growth. Christine, if you'd come. We're told in Hebrews chapter 6 to move beyond the elementary teachings, not to get stuck in a cycle of having to learn them over and over and over again, to grow. The readers here are chastised for not maturing, for needing milk when by all accounts they should have moved on to solid food. They should have moved on to the more complex spiritual issues. But see, the author of Hebrews doesn't just correct them. He also instructs them. He tells them why they're not ready for solid foods. In verse 13, he says that the reason is that they are not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. They're not acquainted with it. Other versions of the Bible say that they are inexperienced in God's teachings, that they're ignorant of God's teachings, and that they are unskilled in the Word of God. You know, when I read this passage, it brings to mind nunchucks. You know what nunchucks are, right? They're those weapons. It's like two of these microphones with a chain in between. I should get me a really cool, like, pastoral nunchuck microphone. That would be awesome. I love nunchucks. They're what Michelangelo used in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's why he was my favorite, because he was using nunchucks. But I remember when I was a, a young teenager, they always sold these foam nunchucks at the county fair. You guys remember that? I always wanted to buy them. I, I think once or twice I did. But every year, I'd pick them up and, and play with them, you know, spinning around and, and lock them under my, you know, I'd, I'd seen enough Bruce Lee movies. I knew how to use them. I was, a, I was an expert. Church, I had to look like an idiot swinging those things around and, and hitting stuff that's next to me, hitting myself in the head or, or worse. Come on, guys. You've been there. I know you have. That hurts. Boy, does it hurt. I was inexperienced in the use of nunchucks. I didn't have mad nunchuck skills. Because I didn't spend time learning the craft. The writer of Hebrews tells us how we can become skilled, how we can become acquainted with God's Word. He tells us how we can mature. 
in our faith. In verse 14, he writes, But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. By what? By constant use. How do we mature in our relationship with the Word? Constant use. How do we get to the point where we can grasp the more complex topics? By constant use. By reading the Word. Studying the Word. Having conversations with people about the Word. Being open to to other people's opinions and, and, and seeing what the Word of God says about it. Listening to sermons. And I don't just mean sermons for me. I mean good preachers. Man, I can give you a list of names. There's some really good preachers that put their stuff all over YouTube. I've threatened to to just to just start watching those and preach them the next week. There's some good stuff out there. Constant use. Listen, I got to tell you something. We we were sitting at the table the other day and we were talking about a, a TV show, a, a comedy, a sitcom. Courtney and I were were basically transcribing this scene to Christina. And in doing so, man, we quoted it word for word. And Christina looked at me, she's like, I just want to know how in the world you know exactly what they said. Because Cordy pulled it up and played it, and it was exactly what I had said. That's how we should be with the word. The reason that I can do that is because I've seen that show way too many times. I have constant use of that sitcom. Writer Hebrews tells us that the way we mature in the Word is through constant use. There's nothing wrong with milk, but milk cannot sustain you forever. We need to mature. Maturity comes through intentional growth, constant use of the Word, reading the Word, studying the Word, discussing the Word. I'm going to ask everyone in the room to bow your head and close your eyes. Is there anyone here that will be honest enough to say, you know what, Pastor? It really comes down to it. I'm pretty immature in spiritual things. I need to give more attention to the Word of God. I need to be more intentional about studying the Word of God. Anyone? Lift your hand. Lord, you see the hands all over the room. God, I'm so thankful for milk. I'm grateful for it. Physical milk and spiritual. God, I'm grateful for how they help us grow beyond infancy. But Lord, just like it would be foolish for us to to give a baby nothing but milk, and then a toddler, nothing but milk, and then a small child, nothing but milk, all the way to adulthood, just like that would be foolish, God. It's foolish for us to get stuck in a cycle where all we ever do is just skim the Word of God. All we ever talk about is salvation, repentance, faith. Lord, I pray that you will let us have a hunger and a thirst for your word. That you'll encourage us, God, to go deeper, to grow stronger, and to require more than just the fundamentals. Help us to mature as a church. Help us to mature as your people. Praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name.